Well, thank you very much. Um, we're very excited to be here. I've never been to Norway before, um, and it's such a beautiful and historic country. Um, and it snowed specially for us. That's right. It's, it's rather expensive, and it's a bit cold, <laughs> but it's also very beautiful and historic. And I have to say, um, my wife, who is sitting there, one of her childhood ambitions, one of her great hopes, was to see the Oseberg ships. And we went yesterday, and so if nothing else happens, you know, we have, <laughs> we have fulfilled Jane's ambition. And she cried all morning. <laughs> Um, so, I'm Jeff Shepard. I'm a clinical psychologist by background. I've worked in mental health services all my career. Um, I began really working in the old mental hospitals in the 1970s and 80s when we were closing the mental hospitals and developing services in the community. And uh, I became then particularly interested in in what we used to call then rehabilitation, uh, working with people who'd been in hospital for a long period of time with severe mental health problems. Uh, and I worked really as a, as a practitioner all my career, but as, as many of you know, eventually you get promoted up to management positions and I ended up as a director in our local service. Um, and I also have I've had a long-standing interest, really, in research into health services, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to pursue those research interests as well. Um, and uh, I became involved in all this recovery stuff um, about uh, six or seven years ago now with Julie and with others, and I'll just let Julie introduce herself. Um, so I'm a rare breed really because I'm, my background is in nursing but um, it was whilst I was training to be a nurse that I had my first admission for mental health problems and um, that has really driven the way that I approach my work. So um, being somebody who, um, who just constantly has these kind of struggles with mental health problems really does fuel an approach and um, probably it was about... 2000, the year 2000 that I um, heard Patricia Deegan speak about her own recovery and it made a huge amount of sense to me and Rachel Perkins and I wrote um, a textbook on recovery in England and now 14 years later it sells more every year as recovery becomes kind of understood and known more. Um, I also, I, so I'm not sort of one of us or one of them, I'm one of us and one of them. Um, and I also, apart from being a nurse and then a service manager, um, I've also um, worked in universities, always holding a joint appointment between a university and a service. So at the moment, I'm professor at Nottingham University and recovery lead in Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust. And I also work um, one and a half days a week nationally with IMROC. And I'm also recovery advisor at the World Health Organization. So kind of really lucky because every day I'm in contact with people in the service I work in who use that service and who work in it and then I have the luxury of coming out of those services and looking from a distance and getting inspiration from other countries and other services. Thank you. And uh, we met with uh, Mark Borg um, uh, on Sunday that you're at a very interesting and kind of exciting time in relation to your recovery journey here in, in Norway. Um, and there is, you know, there is obviously some enthusiasts. Um, there are some people, I guess, who are still a little bit skeptical. You know, what is this recovery? Is it anything we haven't been doing for the last 20 years, you know? Um, is it some version of anti-psychiatry? You know, um, what's it really about and what does it mean, not just at the level, I, I think we were hearing something earlier on about recovery-oriented practice at the level of individual practitioners and people working together, but what does it mean for organizations to say that 
an organization is going to try to support recovery? What does that mean for the organizations as well as for the, the individuals? And those are the kinds of questions that, that we've been struggling with for the last five years or so in England. And as Julie said, we, we represent a kind of group of people. We haven't, it's not just us. Um, there's a, a group of professionals and of service users and we've been working on this national project called IMROC, which I'm going to explain about in a minute. And um, we think we've made some progress, but we know we're just beginning our own journey. And where one of the exciting things is that we don't, we don't quite know where we're going to get to. And I think we think that there probably isn't a final destination. There's simply a process whereby we keep setting our sights higher and higher as to what we expect services can be. And we've felt it necessary to do this because around about the turn of the millennium, around about 2000, we had a big reform of our mental health services. We would more or less closed the mental hospitals, but of course there were still people with complicated and long-term mental health problems who may not have been made so much worse by going into hospital, but they were there going around our admission wards and trying to live their lives in the community and the government decided quite correctly that we needed much much better community services and so now well up until about a year or so ago anyway everywhere in England there were crisis teams and assertive outreach teams and early intervention teams and we created a structure of services which were by and large pretty good you know they've been under a lot of pressure recently because of the financial situation but the services were very good but when we sat and we thought and looked at what was going on in these services what was actually going on was kind of really rather similar to what had always gone on um, and it was professionals focusing on people's symptoms and trying to treat them and then hoping that the rest of their problems in life, their problems of where to live and what to do and how to feel a part of something and how to feel good about themselves, that somehow those, those problems would solve themselves once the professionals had given everybody the benefit of their kind of treatment expertise. Now, of course, we know that that's not the case. And I think, um, uh, I think uh, Offal was saying uh, earlier on about recovery being about, not about people's symptoms necessarily changing, but about helping people live a reasonable life, whether or not, as it were, they've got symptoms we could, that we could treat. So we began, really, with this question about how could we change, in a rather fundamental way, what services were doing to bring the actual services up to date with where they were, which was in the community, not controlling people's lives a lot of the time, but people living their lives and looking to mental health services to try to help them in that process. And so that's what, that's what we've been trying to do. Now, Lars said at the beginning about you know, why have us come here, and that's a good question because we certainly haven't come here to try to tell you what to do. When we work with services at home in England, we say to them, working with you is like working with an individual and their recovery journey. It's, it's their journey, they, they own it, they will decide what they will do with it. They will decide what their goals will be. 
and it's the role of professionals and services to see whether um, they can help with that process. Not to direct it, not to determine what it should be, but to see whether us professionals, and I speak for the moment as a professional, have got anything to do to help people with that process. And so that's what we feel about the situation in Norway. This is your journey. Um, you wish to pursue services which will be more supportive of recovery, or perhaps you don't. I, I don't really know. I guess some of you do and some of you don't. Um, and so that's your choice, and we're not here to tell you you must do things in another way. We're here, I think, just to share our experience with you about what, it, what it's been like for us on, on that journey. And so that's what, that's what we're going to do. And a bit like peer support workers, I suppose the one thing that we can do is we can empathize with your situation because we, we have been there. Um, and if nothing else, actually, that's, that's quite a helpful experience for many people, just to feel that there is somebody around who understands a bit about what it's like, you know, as it were, to, to live your life. So that's, that's, what we, that's what we aim to do. I'm going to begin by describing a bit about this recovery uh, program and about our methodology. We've spent a lot of time thinking about how to do this. And then Julie's going to talk in a bit more detail about some of the methods we've been using. And then I'm going to uh, come on again and talk about measurement and evaluation and outcomes. And then we're going to end up, hopefully, with Julie talking about, um, about leadership. So, um, before we get into all that, because you're a very special audience, we felt that we should, now, is this going to work? Yeah, oh no. Right. We, we should say something about dual diagnosis services. Um, in England, most local mental health services don't have separate dual diagnosis services. Some do, but it's more common of course, it's common that people using mental health services have substance misuse problems. That's absolutely common. But we don't generally have specialist um, uh, dual diagnosis services. And I think probably, although I don't know so much about your dual diagnosis services, probably the substance misuse element of people's problems probably don't get as good specific treatment as they do, I assume, in your services which are, which are specialized in that way. We have specialist substance misuse services, and they are tending, if you like, to look at the people for whom the substance misuse is regarded as their primary problem, but we don't, as I say, have specialist dual diagnosis services. It's also the case in the substance misuse field, and I'm sure it's the same here, that most people think of recovery in terms of stopping or reducing substance misuse. And as I've said already, we don't quite see recovery in that kind of way, although if it's possible to treat people's symptoms, then that's great, but we're actually interested, and we've been interested all along, in people whose problems are difficult to treat and in people whose life problems are still there whether or not you can treat their symptoms. Um, and you'll gather from what I'm going to say and what Julie's going to say is that um, a lot of what we've been doing has been built around working with the people who use services in a way which is new, at least it's new to us, to involve people really as partners, as true partners. Not just evaluating services and saying they aren't very good as far as I'm concerned, but actually to come over and to work with us to help design, deliver, and evaluate new services. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about 
are examples of working with service users in that kind of full and equal partnership, just as though they were any other kind of expert. But their expertise comes from their experience. And although those ideas I know are very familiar in the substance misuse field, they're not so familiar, at least in England, in mainstream mental health services, and they're at the heart of what we've been trying to do. So, you've already heard a bit about defining definitions of recovery. And our definition is very simple. Recovery is about helping people live the lives that they want. End of story. It's really not very complicated or sophisticated. But, Funnily enough, we, we kind of think that our mental health services had, had sort of lost that idea a little bit. In order to do that, it means understanding how people have made sense of what's happened to them, and also it means understanding what's important for them, um, and what kind of help they're looking for in order to live the lives that they want to live. And we focused on three principles, really, uh, um, made a lot of use of these. These were identified by Julie and Rachel Perkins in their book back in 2003. And these principles, are, I don't know whether you talked about it, about hope, control, and opportunity. Okay. So these principles, this is the theory of recovery. And the theory of recovery comes from listening to what people with mental health problems say about what's important to them. So it's not a theory dreamed up by researchers or professionals, it's a theory based on listening to what people say about what's important to them. And what people say is that what's important is that I have some hope, some hope that I can pursue the things that are important to me in my life, that I feel some sense of control over events and myself in order to do that, and that I have opportunities to do that. Um, I'm, I'm not prevented from pursuing my hopes and dreams in a way where I feel a bit un, in control and, and, and so I can, I can pursue my dreams. Now, those are very, very simple ideas, aren't they? And they're ideas that apply to your life and my life and to the lives of all the people who use mental health services. They're not unique to people who use mental health services. It's just some of us are luckier in terms of being able to pursue our hopes, feeling a bit in control and having opportunities. And you know and I know that the history of mental health services has sometimes been not to increase people's sense of hope, to increase their sense of control, to increase the opportunities that they have to pursue their hopes and dreams for the future. And that sometimes people's experience, and I suppose the mental hospital was in a way the most uncomfortable example of this, was a situation where, which did not give people hope, did not give people control, did not give people uh, a sense of opportunity. And when we looked at the new services, the assertive outreach teams, the early intervention teams, the crisis teams, the question that we wanted to ask was, we wanted to ask the people using the service, does contact with this service increase or decrease your sense of hope for the future? Does it increase or decrease your sense of being in control of things? Does it increase or decrease the opportunities you have to pursue those things? And it seems to us, or rather it seemed listening to people using services, that those, were, those are the three kinds of challenges, really, that we, have to, uh, that we have to come up with. So the challenge for mental health professionals we think the idea that we've been pursuing with this recovery stuff is, to how, is how to help people, as I say, to, to use their strengths, their resources to live the lives they want, and at the very least, 
not to put barriers in their way. Now, I'm slightly embarrassed to stand up in front of a, a sophisticated audience and tell you something that is so obvious. And have we got, we've got some service users here, yes, and some family members that say, well, why do you have to bring anybody from England over to tell you that? Because that's absolutely obvious. But the question I would ask you, I don't know the answer, but I know the answer in England, is that the experience of people using services suggests that, that very, those very obvious ideas have been lost somewhere along the line amidst professionals who kind of think that they know best and that their treatments are the things that are going to help and so on and so forth. Now, we believe in professionals. I'm a professional. We believe we have something to offer, but we don't believe we have all the answers. And so that's why we need to work together to try to provide better answers. So that's where we kind of start from. We made sure before we began this that we had some policy backup. And we, my organization I work for now, which is a charity, has got very good contacts with the government and with the civil servants. So we had a new government coming in and they had a new policy, like old governments always have to have a new policy about things, don't they? And so we got a hold of the civil servants and we persuaded them that one of the objectives of the new policy should be that mental health services will help people recover. And we kind of dictated this definition of recovery, which is very similar to Bill Anthony's definition. And they put it into this policy document, no health without mental health. And then we said, and of course, we'll help you do it. So it's very unusual in policy terms. You actually have a policy and you actually have a plan for implementing it. Usually you just have the policy. You never bother to have a plan. Um, but we managed to get the policy and the plan in it. And what's interesting about the definition is that uh, it is a definition of personal recovery. It doesn't say anything about treating people's symptoms. It says mental health services will help people. It says it in a very long way, which is what civil servants do, you know, uh, they write in very long language, but it, it says it's a, it's a, it's a definition of, of, of personal recovery. And so we had this as a policy statement, and we had government backing for the first period in which we worked this national program, and that was, it didn't make anything magical happen, but it was better than not having Policy, uh, policy behind you. So that was good. The program, IMROC, it comes from implementing recovery through organizational change. It began a bit before the policy came out, actually, and it's been delivered by two independent organizations, the Center for Mental Health, where I'm based, and an organization called the Mental Health Network of the NHS Confederation. And the Mental Health Network of the NHS Confederation is an organization for senior managers in mental health services. So the chair of, of the management board, the senior executives um, on the management board of local services, they're likely to be members of the NHS Confederation Mental Health Network. And we decided at the beginning that if we were interested in organizational change, rather than work with professional organizations like psychiatrists or psychologists or nurses or social workers, we would work with managers because we figured that they were going to be quite important in this. And that has actually been, that's been shown to be the case for us. And so we were interested in these two questions. We are interested in what recovery means at the level of individuals working together in a different kind of way. But we're also interested what kind of organizations will support the kinds of changes that will support recovery. Staff can't make people recover. 
staff can only create the conditions in which people can pursue their recovery. And staff can certainly create the conditions in which people can't uh, uh, pursue their own recovery. So we're interested in what are the organizational conditions that would enable us to do this. Because we could see that it meant sometimes changing what staff did, but sometimes simply telling them that the best of what they did was what they should be doing all the time, and the worst of what they did, which they thought was by and large a bit of a waste of time and not what they thought they would do when they, when they left school and went to university and wanted to become a nurse or a psychologist, that is to say, write the most perfect plans in the world, go to terrific meetings, um, you know, that's, that's not what being a good professional is about. Being a good professional is about helping people pursue um, their own lives, uh, the lives that they want. And so what we wanted to do was there were members of staff who were already doing that, and there are here in Norway, and what we, would want, what we wanted to do at home was to tell those people, yes, actually, you're on the right track. And the people you know, who are spending so much time in their office writing out perfect care plans and having wonderful meetings together, which you know, never involve the patients or their families, they have lost the plot. So we're interested in, as we're working with the best of, of the existing system, and it does mean changing, or at least encouraging staff. Yeah, I'm going to stop it. I'm just it's over. Oh, it does mean working with the organisation. I'm, I'm nearly there, too. Um, because it can't be achieved simply by training. The thing that we know about training, and you know about it, it doesn't matter what the training is. If you take staff out of their work setting and you train them to, I don't know, do DBT or, or something, um, and then you put them back and look to see whether they do it or not, they never do it. They never do it unless the organization has been changed such that their manager and their manager's manager and everybody supports this new set of skills. So we knew we had to work on not just staff behavior, but also the organization's behavior. So um, that's what we've been trying to do. And where we started was through these 10 key challenges. And what I'm going to do is if I um, hand over to Julia, we'll talk about the 10 key challenges. But before I do that, just to steal a bit of extra time, we didn't know what these organizational changes were going to be. And because we didn't know it, we figured we needed to go out and ask people who were already trying to do this, people like yourselves, what are the organizational changes that get in your way? And that's how we generated these 10 key organizational challenges that Julie's going to talk about. Then we began to work with local trusts, and we've now worked with, there are about 50 mental health services in England, each of them serving around about a million people. Uh, and we've worked with about two-thirds of them now. And the way that we work is we go onto the site, we take a service user with us, we get them to work through these challenges, we get them to set goals, and then we get them to try to achieve those goals, and if it works, all very well, and if it doesn't, we encourage them to, whoops, to go around the loop again. So it's a simple process of organizational change through setting goals and, um, uh, and, uh, and moving forward in that kind of way. And we support that process through what we call these action learning sets. The action learning sets have been very interesting. They've been used in industry. Some of you may have, have, have heard of this kind of approach. And it's an approach, if you like, which gets together people from, say, six different sites in Norway. You'd come together for a day, and the group that came would be a group of professionals and service users and managers and carers. 
And that would be the same from each of the sites. And you'd all get together and you'd discuss how you were doing to change your organization. And you would be encouraged to steal ideas from one another. Uh, and you'd be encouraged to meet with people in between the action learning sets and provide one another with support because this is a difficult process. So these action learning sets help clarify goals, they help give people support, and they've proved very, very helpful in supporting people tackling these 10 key challenges. The other thing that we've done is we've, we've produced lots of bits of paper, and we're going to show a few of these. These are all available on our website. We've done webinars and I've been forced into tweeting, which I, anyway, that's what I have to do. Um, because there is a communication issue here, we have to get these ideas out into the field to be discussed. And so these, these briefing papers have been a, a part of that, that process. Um, and that's been, that's been important too. But bits of paper never changed anything. You know, policies never change anything. It's when you can get people to engage in this process, having chosen the goals, and they get support, that's when things start to change. I just want to talk about the ten challenges which the kind of expert sites that we consulted with um, proposed as being the indicators of services which were doing okay in terms of supporting recovery. And we use these challenges then when we go into a new site, a new organization, we ask the site to review where they are at in relation to these challenges and to select three of them to focus on, to work in in depth. But what they are, it's really interesting, if you're a really recovery focused site, then you will have a very different kind of um, quality of experience for the people using the service. People using the service will be clear that from the day they come into contact with that service, they do know that it's possible for them to recover. People talk about their future, about possibility. They give them hope. People allow them to take control to the extent that they're able to. You know, when you're, you're most distressed and desperate, you are very happy for professionals to make decisions for you, often. I am, um, but very quickly you want to be asked what you want. Do you want any more of this medication, that medication, does this kind of, of therapy help? Do you feel ready to start a graded return to work? So you need to have more control and the other thing is you want services that enable you to access the kind of community activities, opportunities and resources you want. So the first thing we're looking for is, a very, um, is an evidence change in the quality of the experience of people using services. The second thing is that staff need to have access to learning opportunities. Staff need to be able to learn about recovery, but also about all the different ways in which they can enable people to take back control. And so, there need to be a range of different um, courses, action learning sets, mentoring, supervision, and all of these need to be co-developed and co-delivered alongside people who themselves have experience of using the service. The third thing is that people themselves who use the service need to have access to learning opportunities. They need to access what we call a recovery college, which is um, exactly what you would understand by the word college. You know, it's an educational institution where people can go and learn about how to manage their own condition, how to, how to make sense of what's happened to them, how to adjust to the kind of changes, how to get a good night's sleep, how to deal with childhood abuse and trauma, our colleges have around between 50 and 100 courses every term on offer. All of those course colleges are co-developed, co-delivered, 
co-facilitated and um, co-received, so staff and service users work together to develop and deliver a course. And in the classroom, the people who participate are people with a range of different experiences. The general public, family members and staff can come and learn. Um, and they might be coming to a very short introductory session that's run in an inpatient ward, or they might be going to a 12-week course which is on some kind of mindfulness training. Now, the recovery colleges are particularly interesting, and we have briefing papers and publications on those on the IMROC website. Um, and this is one of the challenges which many of the sites that we've worked with have selected, because this is about starting afresh, something new. It's actually less difficult to set up a new recovery college than it is to change the culture, change the day-to-day -day interactions. Um, so we say we've worked with 30 sites, but there are now 31 recovery colleges in England. They've all established within the last four years. The fourth one is trying to ensure this organizational commitment, a culture in which staff values, the services that are provided, the kind of structures are all in line with recovery. It's all aligned. So recovery is understood by the board, by the senior managers in the organization. They understand what it is. They understand what it means for their own work. And they know what they're looking for when they're looking at their services. It's also something which needs to be understood by people using the services, family members, by practitioners, and perhaps hardest of all, recovery needs to be understood and, and wanted by middle managers, by the people who hold the budgets. And it's that middle level, actually, which we find is the most tricky. We have a huge appetite for recovery from grassroots level, from the practitioners, from the service users. We have a real appetite from boards who say this is and from policy but in the middle the people who are balancing the books they're perhaps the ones that we need to work hardest with working offering new learning opportunities workshops for them to understand what their role can be um, the fourth of our challenges is to increase personalization and choice and i know in norway you have you have a lot going on around person-centered care, this individualized approach to working, which means that services are finding ways of ensuring that people can pursue their own personal ambitions and get the very individualized kind of support which they need in order to pursue those. Transforming the workforce, this is um, another area which we have had a very big impact, and this is um, changing the skill mix in teams. So introducing lived experience um, into the workforce, employing peer support workers. In the trust that I work in, we've set um, a strategic goal that we will have two peer support workers in every single clinical team. But you know, as we start to train and develop and define what peer support what workers are, Essentially, they are people who provide support which draws on their own experience. It isn't about telling people their own experience. It is about the kind of empathy, the kind of approach which comes from having been on the other side of the fence. Um, and as we've started to do that, we've discovered a very high proportion of staff, professional staff, have themselves got experience of mental health problems. And until now, they felt worried about using that, about um, disclosing that, but increasingly they're willing to, like myself, to talk about their own experience. Um, we've done surveys in around five of our, these large services and we find between 34 and 40 percent of staff have experience of mental health problems. So how do we get them to use that in their daily work? It's a shift in the whole workforce, the way that this works. Changing the way we approach risk assessment and management. Now, risk and recovery are really at polar ends of, of kind of policy, really, in that we have policy talking about recovery, which is about increasing personal choice, personal control, um, personal decision-making. And then we have the law, which is actually seeing, in England at least, a very high increase in the use of the Mental Health Act, in taking away people's power. If we're to work with recovery, we need to find a way of bringing these together. And so we're increasingly looking at how we create 
shared decision making, negotiated safety plans, relational risk assessment. We start to trust people to be able to tell us how we as professionals can make them feel safe. They tell us why they might be, um, or how they know when things are not safe for them, how we can help them at those moments in time. And so it's a, a negotiated safety plan rather than a professionally led risk assessment. And then we have, as Jeff said, radically changed notions of user involvement. This is absolutely not about us involving service users in the work we do. This is about us working as equals. This is about people with lived experience coming up with ideas and us helping them work with it. Us coming up with ideas and them helping us work with it. Their expertise comes from their experience, ours comes from training. And so it really is about co-production, co-production of everything that we do. And, you know, we can't expect the staff in our services to work in this very optimistic, constructive, you know, recovery-focused way if they themselves are not well, resilient, um, supported, if they don't themselves have hope for their own career, if they don't have some control over their own working pattern. And so we're also looking for services to support staff in their own well-being. And finally, but hugely importantly, services need to be very actively supporting people to access opportunities so that they can achieve their own life goals. But more than that, they need to be maintaining, maintaining those opportunities throughout crises so that when people come into services, they don't lose their job, their friends, their house. We actually keep those things and we help to put in place the kind of supports to make them accessible as they return back, as they recover. So those are the ten challenges which we, take, we talk to sites about and they make a decision about which ones of those they want to focus on and move forward with. Um, as a result of these, of, of working with sites, in England I think there's, um, there are well over 200 people who have themselves used mental health services, who are now employed on an equal basis, equal pay, the same job descriptions as, as professional staff. Um, many of those are working as peer support workers, but of course we also have paid peer trainers working in the recovery colleges. We have peer researchers. Um, and We've introduced, we've actually written up where we've got to in this journey. We've kind of reviewed the evidence in terms of the theory and practice, but also created a very practical guide to how services might go about recruiting, training, employing, and supporting and supervising peers successfully. Um, recovery colleges, as I said, you know, we've, we have this initial briefing paper, we've written this briefing paper, but also um, we've done some research subsequently, which has been published around recovery colleges. And each of these 32 recovery colleges, which are now open in England, and in fact, we've also helped supported countries like um, Hong Kong, Japan, Australia, Italy, at least, to open their recovery colleges. And we do find in everywhere that these are opened that they are incredibly popular. People with experience of mental health problems want to find out more about these problems. They want to understand them. And in the course of attending the colleges, they don't just get taught what this means. They learn from the other students. They make friends. The, the number of friends that are made in college, just the same as when you go to further education college, and there's a very high level of completion. 70% of people complete the courses which they register for. And many of these courses are around personal recovery. So many of the students end up filling, completing their own personal recovery plan. 65% at least talk about having more hope after they've been to college. And a huge number go on to um, employment, to make some kind of employment, education, volunteering some kind of meaningful activity. The college is a real route out into the community, into meaningful lives. 
And there is some evidence that when you go along to recovery college, of course, you don't need so much support from the community service. The other thing that we've done is to think very carefully about risk um, and really to think about how this relates to shared decision making, very closely aligned, you know, um, a, a negotiated safety plan and a process of sharing decision making, whether that's about your medication, whether it's about whether you're ready to go back to work, how you're going to manage your home, but really you and the, your professional, the person who's supporting you, talking about together, bringing together your personal expertise with their professional expertise to make decisions about the best way forward. Um, in fact, by, by moving towards negotiated safety plans, we found that staff have huge benefits. We see improved job satisfaction and reduced sickness and absence reduce workforce costs and reduce staff turnover. Staff much prefer working in environments where, where they're not using restraint, where there's a much more negotiated approach to safety. And people using the service, of course, are restrained less often, they have fewer injuries, but also they have shorter lengths of stay. They're, they're making more decisions for themselves. They feel that sense of responsibility more. They're on less medication have increased positive outcomes. And we can see here that in Mersey Care in England, um, they introduced an intervention at this point, and there's a very obvious change from the levels of physical restraint happening before that point and the levels afterwards. And if you look at the aggregated mean across from, the, from pre intervention, it's just below 20 and the aggregated mean post-intervention is just below 10 incidents. So very dramatic changes. And what's perhaps most interesting is that at the same rate as the incidence of restraint reduce, the incidence of stuff sickness reduce too. Do you have the word co-production here? Is there a word for co-production? Co-production actually originated, it was a term that was used in relation to IKEA. IKEA, you know, the, where, where you know, the, the store produces the furniture and, and the cost can be reduced because you go home and put it together. So you both have a role in it. And, and in England, this has now been taken into public services very much. So looking at how we can, instead of seeing people who use services as a burden, as a set of symptoms and problems, we see them as assets who can help us as we provide the service, not just in their own care, but also they can bring their skills, their life skills, to support other people using the service, to help us to make decisions and to run groups. They can come and help run courses in the recovery college. So everything we do is about bringing that professional expertise and that personal experience together in a reciprocal relationship. And that runs right out into community development, where we try to use the assets within a community for mutual benefit to support their families, their neighbors, in their mental health. And at the same time, those individuals bring their skills to together, together. So we don't have the all-powerful, all-knowing professionals who are responsible for doing everything, and then those passive recipients. We actually, both parties, co-produce our services co-deliver them and co-evaluate them. So it's very different from, from us as the experts involving service users. It is a genuine partnership. 